Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. In part one, we learned how to use starlight to measure the distance and chemical composition of stars. Today, we'll look at how we can classify stars using the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And in part three, we'll learn about variable stars. On a clear night, you can see thousands of stars in the sky. Some are bright, while others are dim, and they vary a little in colour. They mostly appear whitish, but you may be able to see slight differences. This picture shows the brightest 300 stars in the night sky. Humans, and especially scientists, love to categorise objects into groups with similar properties. How are we going to do that with stars? We've grouped stars into shapes called asterisms, but that's just a product of our imagination. It doesn't tell us much about the science. We can also see a line where there are more stars. This is the galactic plane and will be the subject of a future video. Today, we're going to consider the properties of the stars themselves. Some stars appear much brighter than others. As discussed in part one, this is partly due to their distance from us, which doesn't tell us much about their properties. So let's change the picture from apparent magnitude to absolute magnitude, bringing these 300 stars to a distance of 10 parsecs. Stars appear as single points of light in the night sky, but star maps generally use larger dots to represent brighter stars. Almost all stars appear white to the human eye, so I've exaggerated the colour differences here using standard astronomical colours. Stars emit black body radiation, or close to it, so their colour is related to their temperature. This map shows the stars' locations in the sky. Let's sort them into something more useful. First, we'll arrange the stars by brightness, with brighter stars at the top. The y-axis here is luminosity. This means the power of the star, the amount of electromagnetic energy released per second as a multiple of our sun's power. Next, we'll arrange them by temperature. Hotter stars go to the left. We're starting to see some clear patterns with groups of stars. These patterns are clearer if we add a few more stars. With 30,000 stars, the patterns become very obvious. There's a definite link between brightness and temperature, and there are clear groups of different types of stars. This is called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, although nobody can remember how to spell it, so astronomers usually just say HR diagram, and that's good enough for Google. There are many ways of drawing a HR diagram, and astronomers haven't really been able to agree on one standard, but they generally follow the same basic form. The x-axis shows surface temperature in reverse order, hottest to the left. The y-axis shows luminosity, the energy or power radiated by the star. And both axes usually use a logarithmic scale. You might notice that for some stars the colour doesn't precisely match the temperature. The reasons for this are quite complex, and we're not going to worry about it for the GCSE course. The Hertzsprung-Russell diagram was developed independently in the 1910s by Danish astronomer Einar Hertzsprung and American astronomer Henry Russell. Over the last century, we've learnt a lot about the properties of stars, which helped us classify them into groups. Astronomers started classifying stars by colour. American astronomer Annie Jump Cannon came up with a system of letters to designate spectral type, a fancy astrophysics word for colour. Star colours are very subjective, and the colour names used for stars aren't quite the same as the names we'd use elsewhere. Certainly, A and G don't look white and yellow. Jump Cannon's original system was alphabetical, but as we learned more about stars, some letters were reordered, while others were added or dropped. Astronomers like to remember the current order using the mnemonic O, B, A, fine, girl or guy, kiss me. Cecilia Payne, Annie Jump Cannon's British-American colleague, was the first to realise that the colours of stars are directly related to their temperature, resulting in a partial reordering of the letters. Blue stars are the hottest, and orange-red stars are the coolest. Within each spectral type, we now have 10 subdivisions. Higher numbers represent lower temperatures. So, for example, the sequence F8, F9, G0, G1 represents progressively cooler stars. So, now that we understand the HR diagram, let's look at the different regions in it. The main sequence is normal stars. 
Most stars, including the Sun, are main sequence stars. These are sometimes called dwarf stars. This is misleading. In the early 20th century, we'd only been able to study very large stars, and main sequence stars were the smallest that we'd observed. Now we know that main sequence stars are quite large, and the Milky Way is full of stars too small and dim to make it onto this diagram of the 30,000 brightest. Our Sun is in fact in the top 10% by size. But the name stuck, and the Sun is officially a dwarf star. Stars in the upper left of the main sequence are hot, bright and massive, while stars to the lower right are cooler, dimmer and less massive. Here is the Sun. A G2 yellow dwarf, with a temperature around 5800 Kelvin. Stars at the top of the diagram are giant stars. This region shows red giants in the top right. Red giants are roughly the mass of our Sun, but have reached the end of their life, having exhausted most of their hydrogen fuel. When this happens, the star grows to around 200 times its previous size, and the surface cools to about 5000 Kelvin. We'll talk more about these changes in a future video on the life of stars. Another type of red giant, in the same part of the HR diagram, is a massive star in the main part of its life. These are not usually classified as main sequence stars, even though they're still fusing hydrogen. They emit thousands of times as much light, but mostly red and infrared. To the top left are blue giants. There are several types of blue giants with various properties, but all are very massive, hot and bright. They are also old stars, having exhausted their hydrogen fuel. Blue giants are only about 5 to 10 times the size of the Sun, but their temperatures are 10,000 Kelvin or more. Some reach 30,000 Kelvin and emit 100,000 times as much light as the Sun. At the bottom are white dwarfs. These are the small, dense remnants left behind when a red giant finally dies. Nuclear fusion stops, so by some definitions this is technically not a star. The stellar remnant shrinks to about the size of Earth, becoming highly compressed. White dwarfs are typically around 10,000 Kelvin or hotter, but only about one thousandth the luminosity of our Sun. None are bright enough to be seen from Earth without telescopes. And finally we have supergiants above the giants. When a very massive main sequence star reaches the end of its life, it becomes much bigger and brighter than a red giant becoming a red supergiant, or even an extreme blue supergiant. They are hundreds of times the size of the Sun, and many times more massive. Their luminosity is at least a thousand times the Sun's, and in some cases, over a million times the Sun's. Supergiants span a wide range of temperatures, from cool red supergiants at 3400 Kelvin, up to hot blue supergiants over 40,000 Kelvin. These are the main regions of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. For the GCSE exam, you should be prepared to sketch a simple diagram, label a pre-drawn diagram, or identify a star's type from its location. There are other types of stars not shown here. Hypergiants, above the top of this diagram, aren't part of the GCSE syllabus. And black dwarfs, black holes and neutron stars aren't bright enough to make it onto the HR diagram. We'll discuss the evolution of stars in a future video, The Life of Stars, when we'll learn how stars move on this diagram throughout their life. Remember, this isn't actual motion, as the graph doesn't show location. Finally today, how can we use the HR diagram to find the distance to a star? In part one, we learned the distance modulus formula. This has three variables, absolute magnitude, apparent magnitude, and distance. If we know two variables, we can calculate the third. First, we find a star's apparent magnitude, from simple observations. Next, we need absolute magnitude. Find the star's colour and what type it is, and this will give you its location on the HR diagram. We've used luminosity for the y-axis, but you can replace this with absolute magnitude. Now, we use the equation to find d, the distance in parsecs. This method is approximate. To get a precise measure of a star's absolute magnitude is more complex, and official distances to stars often have a high margin of error. For the GCSE exam, you should be able to explain this method, but you won't need to do the calculation. That's all for today. 
In part three, we'll learn what makes some stars vary in brightness over time. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and have an excellent day.